take a look at work in uh, the whole area of uh, social media uh, because it's a big, big changing world we're dealing with. Uh, I am, I am a career counselor with the Actors Fund Work Program. Uh, John Matson is in the back somewhere. Uh, he's our director. Uh, we, uh, Caitlin is here. She is our coordinator, amazing. And uh, Karen, who couldn't be here today, uh, is another person in, in that particular staff. Um, we first of all would like to thank uh, our uh, collaborators on this particular uh, career panel, the SAG Foundation, who was kind enough to, you know, we looked at it and we said, what do, we, what do our people need? And our missions are very, are different because we're helping you look at work outside of the industry to help you stay in the industry. And uh, I know that in the case of SAG Foundation, they're trying to help you do things for your industry. But I can, can promise you, no matter what reason you have come today, you will find something, you will pick up something to be able to work with. I see so many familiar faces in the crowd, it's fabulous. So um, we have a, a really uh, stellar panel. I can't even call it any, any more than that or any less than that. Uh, we picked out four people who I know uh, will be helpful to you in exploring what your options are in this particular area. First of all, before we get started, if you have, and we probably all do, our little phones in our purses or our, uh, or our pockets, please turn them on to vibration or turn them off, please, just out of respect for the audience and also respect for, your, uh, for the panelists. All right? Thank you for doing that. And let's get started. I'm just going to introduce our panelists, get started with that. Please help me to w welcome Terry Thomas, who is a creative director of Gravity Summit and president of Rocky Peak Enterprises. Terry, come on up. They're going to each just have a seat, and then we'll get started. Our next one is uh, uh, Rob Getchman. Rob, uh, we, he's, he's a writer, he's an editor, and he's a musician. And he has worked with places like LinkedIn and uh, Apple and all sorts of wonderful things. And he is a good proof of an artist who has a, um, a parallel career in social media. Please help us welcome Rob. And we have uh, Bonnie L. Uh, Ebner. Bonnie is director of uh, Bettner Creative Management and Photography. Bonnie is a photographer. And anybody f do photography here? Make a lot of money at it that lately? You know, I thought it, 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 it's like acting. It can take time to get things going. And she has created her own business and has a parallel career as a uh, social media expert. Please welcome Bonnie. And how do I say enough about Serena Ehrlich? There is an, <laughs> she'll say it for me. Um, basically, uh, really, uh, Serena is a social media expert. She uh, is always doing amazing things. She is the president of social media in Los Angeles. And uh, please help me to welcome her. So you see, we have really quite a great group here to be able to help you. And what we're going to be doing, the process is, I'm going to, um, e each person is going to tell you a little bit about their story and how they're involved in social media. Uh, they'll take about 15, 20 minutes to do that. And then we're going to come, I may be asking some questions that did not get covered, you know, just to help. And you have cards. Did you, did you see those cards yet that, that uh, are being passed around? If you have certain questions, when you write them down, and what you'll do is there'll be people that will be walking up and down this aisle, and they will collect them, and then they will get them to me. And uh, when we're ready for Q&A, that's what we'll do. All right? So we're all on the same page? Great. So let's get started with uh, Terry Thompson. Uh, Terry Thompson, I'll give you a little bit more information on her. She, uh, Terry served as media director of U2 singer Bono's uh, Red Campaign with Fortune 500 partners and held marketing and production positions at ABC, CBS, and NBC. Terry is also an adjunct professor, social media for business at Woodbury University, where she teaches a course in social media. Ms. Thompson is considered a leader in entertainment content, social network marketing, mobile, um, 
gaming, online, auto, retail, QSR, and sales promotion. Just a, <laughs> just a few other things that she happens to do. And uh, she brings unique 360 perspective to strategies and tactics for reaching consumers and audiences. And I just want to mention, we just have this up here. Uh, we're not selling any books today, but um, we, did anybody come to the um, career panel that the Actors uh, uh, Fund did uh, at Valley Days, which was on social media, Beverly Macy? Well, it turns out, and this is how things work, we had no idea that Terry is the co-author with Beverly Macy of the book, The Power of Real-Time Social Media Marketing. And uh, Caitlin had met Terry uh, at a CBS interview that they both did. And lo and behold, small world. We all had something in common. So we're really happy to have Terry here. So I'm going to give it over to her. Well, thank you very much. This is such a, a wonderful um, opportunity for me to be here because having spent so many years in entertainment, um, over 27 years in marketing and advertising, starting from the very beginning, from uh, an, an entry level position in sales to being writing, doing writing and producing commercials and promos and ending up in the executive side over at CBS where I oversaw the stations around the country and how they promoted the programs. I got to meet so many of you actors, writers, producers, directors, above the line, below the line, worked hours on the sets, you know, visited the sets too, so I know your world, I know your joy, I know your pain. <laughs> uh, but I also, um, there's so much to say, but I wanted to make sure that I give you some bits of information about social media, but also because I, we're in the age group, I'm a, a baby boomer, and there are a lot of baby boomers here. And because I teach social media strategy and marketing at two universities now, and doing this literally around the world, was in Cuba this summer, and there, everybody's asking the same questions that you are here. What is it? What are we doing? Does it matter to me? And is it going away? No, it's not. So um, let me start with my path, and then I'll get to the point, some of the points that I want to share with you to dispel the fears dispel some of the misconceptions about social media. And you're going to be in a five count when I get, okay? I can lecture for hours, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, um, I started again um, at KNBC here in Los Angeles. I'm a native Southern Californian. And I, got, I wanted to get my, my foot in the door, and I knew once I got inside that I could prove myself. And I, start, I always think of myself as a writer first. And that was my basis. So when I got into sales, I would write the, um, the sales letters that the executives would send to their clients, like Vons at the time and you know, Auto and so on. Well, I think that's important no matter what you do. Always do what you love and try to work it into whatever it is that you're doing. Well, lo and behold, time goes on. I ended up being an executive in advertising and marketing um, over at, um, at uh, CBS for many years and dealt with their stations, as I mentioned. I worked over at Disney as well in syndication. I spent a lot of years over at CBS. And then I was hired over at ABC as director of marketing. And that was in the year 2001. That's when I really got started into social media. Because as a person in entertainment and as a person in um, marketing and advertising, I always wanted to know what the viewer or the audience thought. And I was always separated because, you know, in television and marketing, I still do this, there's the research group or the focus groups. And I, th I don't care about them because if, if research groups were accurate, we would have the best shows on television. <laughs> we would have, you know, blockbusters. Every film would be a blockbuster. And I, there's something wrong with these focus groups, okay? So um, I always wanted to talk to the audiences. And so what happened was when social media started happening with chat rooms and forums, um, I was over at ABC and uh, I had the good fortune of working with J.J. Abrams. You know, he was doing Alias at the time. And I saw some opportunity there because what was happening is that uh, audiences, TV audiences, were going away, especially males 18 to 34. And they're going to play video games. So I took the opportunity to talk to my executives. I had some great people I worked with, Alan Cohen and Mike Benson over at ABC. And um, I said, look, I want to do a video game for Alias. You know, I want to engage. And, this, and now with social media, that's one of the key words. How do you engage people? How do I, I want to engage audiences between the episodes that air. I want to keep them connected to the network so we can talk to them. And I wanted to do it with a video game. So JJ was all for it. And I got everybody on the cast and the crew to, to participate in this. And it went ballistic. It was great. And it's the first time anybody ever did a video game for an entertainment television show. Now they do it all the time. 
But that was my beginning over 10 years ago. And so that kept growing. I got to do some campaigns for uh, My Name is Earl, of launching some shows over at NBC, you know, Friday Night Lights, and a couple of other shows too, using social media. Well, what happened was, as that evolution uh, occurred, I was also asked to work at a media agency. So here I am on one side of the desk at the networks, and working with actors and actresses and talent. And then I get asked to be on the other side, working at a media agency. They're, they, they're the ones who um, place the commercials on the networks and so on. So here I am working, and I have clients like Hyundai and Kia and Home Depot, Victoria's Secret, and so on. But every time they would launch something, a product or a brand, if it's an automobile, they always would say, they'd refer back to entertainment. It's, we're going to uh, market this car like a star. <laughs> or we're going to promote this like a film. Think, well, I can do this. I've done entertainment all my life. This is pretty easy. So that was a transportable way for me to take my skills in entertainment again, put them into media, and again, growing social media. Because what's happening there, we're talking about more communities. You know, this community is the term for groups of people sharing information uh, and interests, like interests. So I started doing um, mobile apps and music communities and launched the Kia car called the Soul and the Genesis for Hyundai and did some other campaigns too. After I left the media agency, people were calling me. Well, Terry, we're going to launch, we're going to have a, a nonprofit uh, event here in LA called Remote Area Medical. And it's, for, it's going to be at the forum. We want you to help with the marketing. Well, I ended up with people from all around the world and coming to this. And we got um, uh, the ABC News was there every day of the week. We're on primetime news. I'm thinking, well, this stuff works. <laughs> this stuff really works here. And so I kept doing that because not only now could I talk to the audiences, but now I can talk to the consumers, the viewers, the, the people like you and me. I can talk directly to you and me. And there is such power in that. And one of the big things in social media is content, as they say. Well, as a creative community, you have content. Content is part of who you are, whether you're a photographer or a writer or an actor or a musician, you can create that. You are creative people. Now, I deal with businesses and organizations. I, I advise, uh, I'm the social media advisor to the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce. And I'm dealing with organizations of all kinds and government agencies too. And when they think about social media, they're a little bit scared for one reason, is that what do I do? You know, what, what kind of content do we have? where you are the creative groups and you can come up with these things. So what, for you, what, and each one of you is a brand as well, and you're probably all going to touch on this as, as we go down the line here, but this is something I want to emphasize too, is that when you think in, in marketing terms, you are, each one of you is a brand. Each one of you has significant assets, creativity, imagination, a, um, you know, just great abilities that you probably just kind of take for granted as well. But I bet if I sat down with each one of you, I'd pull out your story. Because ultimately, social media is storytelling. But it's, it's, it's also story listening. And, what, and the strategy that I teach is not just about posting things and pictures of your vacation and such. It's the strategy that goes with this. There's a real thoughtful way to do this. Get all of your alignment of your branding consistent. Uh, what is your persona? That means what's the personality type that you want to convey in social media? Once you understand that what you're doing in social media is really what, like what we do when we talk to each other here, it's just on digital platforms, it's the digital handshake is what it is. So if you can get over some of the, uh, some of the fears or concerns. The other thing I want to say before I have to cut myself off is um, some of the, I'm going to throw out some statistics so you can get an idea of what's happening here. Um, about three weeks ago, Facebook just announced they had over one billion users. So it would be the third largest country in the world, if it were. And the United States is 345 million people, so you can get an idea of the, the, the scope here. Um, the, one of the biggest fears about social media is not being able to control the conversation. And this is really tough for actors, you know, because <laughs> you're, it, part of that your personality is, you know, I want to be able to do the best that I can, but the criticism is just too much, you know. But in social media, you really need to be open. And there's not a way to control the conversation, but through a strategy and being thoughtful about it, you can manage the conversation. Now, this goes for people, businesses, whoever you are. Isn't it better to be able to put out the correct information about yourself than have somebody else make incorrect statements and put out incorrect information? So you manage the conversation to a degree. 
And then it's really important to understand that, um, that listening is absolutely the basis for social media success. Think about this. If you're just talking about yourself, and that's, if you think about the full circle of 100% um, interaction, you're giving information, people are talking back to you. If you're only giving 50% information, you're only being halfway effective. That's why in social media, the part of that is really critical is the listening and asking questions, finding out what's important to your fans, to your followers, to the people who are in your life, lifestyle elements. So it's not all about you. I'm afraid to say that. It's not all about you. But it's really about the people around you and who are part of your world and then expanding that. And they will, when they connect, especially with people like you in entertainment, with Los Angeles being an international market, it is so strong and potent. I've seen this happen so many times in things that I've done. If you mention the Hollywood connection, the LA connection, that international appeal is going to be is going to help ignite your efforts. Um, I'm trying to watch. Them. Is, well, should I move on? I'm taking care of that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Go see my hand, okay. She's not going to pull the hook. Um, let's see. The other things about social media that I want to emphasize about what is community. Um, over 100,000 people a day around the world are joining a community of some sort. That doesn't mean just on Facebook. Facebook gets the biggest, uh, is the loudest voice. But that means people coming together like about wine tasting, like, uh, or about art, or music, or a certain type of uh, picture, or a, a, a fan of, a, of an, an actor or an, an actress. Those are groups. We call them communities. And so this phenomenon, social media, is not going away. It is international. Um, in Eastern Europe, Odno Klasniki and uh, Vkontakte are the big social media platforms in Russia and Eastern Europe. China is a hugely social media uh, country. They use it all the time. They just don't get Facebook. But we can actually sign in to QQ and Sina Weibo. Um, in South America, Orkut was really big, and so was High Five, but now uh, Facebook is getting bigger there, too. If you look at a world map, most of the world now is covered by Facebook being the strongest voice in social media, which is one reason to consider being there. But the, the other part of listening in social media is to find out, do you really need to be on Facebook? Should you be, have more of a presence on um, Pinterest or Instagram? Or SlideShare is one of those places where you can have presentations and people don't in increase your brand and your awareness as an expert. These are different platforms, and you don't want to, it could be overwhelming. That's why you want to go a little bit at a time and be very slow. This is the paradox. Social media is very fast, it's real time. You know, for the first time in our history, we have this shift of communication where we can know right now what people are eating, doing, drinking, whatever, here in Los Angeles, in New York in Beijing, Dubai, wherever. We can do this now, and it is a shift. Okay, so because of that shift, because that conversation is able to take place, it is changing the nature of businesses and industries. So when you as a talent, and then you as a having these parallel careers in your life, there are two questions that I think are critical today to think about, and hopefully you'll take some information away. One is to learn about social media for yourself so you can become a social media um, advisor. I don't like to call myself expert because things change in social media so fast you can be obsolete in a day. <laughs> but but there's, so there's the use of social media as an individual for your own craft, and there's the use of social media to advise other people and help them with their businesses too. And so I would recommend if you haven't taken any steps yet or you've been a little bit slow or you just started in social media, get really good at one first. And one of the easiest ones to do is Twitter. I think Twitter is really easy to make a profile with Twitter. And once you get started, though, think about what you want that name to be because you want to have consistent branding across all of the different social media platforms as you grow them out. So be your name, be who you are. You know, I'm Terry Thompson across all my platforms. I have to put the one because there are zillions of Terry Thompsons in the world, but I got the number one after mine. But don't, be, don't have some cute little funny name and help be hard to find because a lot of this is related to and most of it is related to about being discovered and being found because the reason for being on social media in a big world, in a big uh, world where every, over 83% of Americans go to social media for information. That doesn't mean just to say hello and see pictures of family. That means to find out about where to buy property 
or, uh, or about jobs or financial institutions or what's the latest news uh, that's critical news around the world. Social search, the little search bar in social media, is now out searching Google because people go to their sites, to LinkedIn, to, uh, to Facebook, to uh, Twitter to find news. So it's about being found and it's about getting, increasing your search engine optimization, meaning getting you found on digital. So when people go searching for you, they're going to find you in a lot of different places. So I'm throwing, throwing out a lot of different stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to just interject a little bit. Please do. Uh, if somebody wanted to, I mean, certainly getting their own platform together is really important because I think that's a good beginning. But in your mind, if they wanted to look at jobs that were out there, what kind of jobs do you think they could find that would be out there under social media that you're seeing happening? If you, um, a lot of the, it depends again on your ability. What's your ability? You can assess your ability and knowledge of social media. If you just go into uh, Twitter and do social media jobs, if you go to Craigslist and uh, go search social media uh, careers, you're going to find everything from social media assistant to social media director. And, uh, and it's, so it's one of those professions that, oh, okay, it's one of those professions that you really want to be able to walk the walk and talk the talk because um, that's why it's important for you if you don't have a presence on social media yet to learn the, the, the channels and the platforms because they're going to look to you, if you're going to say I know how to manage social media, they're going to expect you to do that and deliver. It's not like being an actor, can you talk about acting or can you really act? I mean, there's the difference there. And so, uh, so there are jobs out there. In fact, it's one of the jobs where there really is a critical need for people to, who have the, to have those skills. And it's one of, this is the biggest, one of the biggest uh, growing areas of, um, of business right now. Thank you. Why don't we give her an applause? We're going to have more, many more applauses. Thank you, Terry. And we're all going to get to hear more information. We're just going to go through just this, this summation. Uh, when sure. With you, uh, picking up where Terry has left off, uh, I think if you could just sort of lay out a baseline of what social media is, because it's such an amorphous term, I feel like it's just um, it's a hyper-connected set of tools that enable creative, both creative expression and creative consumption. So you're either signing up as someone who wants to express something to a mass audience or consume from a uh, mass mass sources, uh, whether it's Ashton Kutcher or your favorite band or the marketing uh, Twitter handle from a movie that's coming out, whatever. You can follow all those things so you can get news on the sources that, uh, on, the, on the stuff that matters to you. Um, but that said, um, I think what that means is that these are a set of tools. So to sign up for all of them as sort of a, you know, a plan to assault social media, with your own voice is like buying a ton of art supplies and just like packing them around your room and being like, I'm just gonna launch this assault on creativity. Um, so you've, I mean, it, it is a good idea to just start with one and you know, Twitter at 140 characters uh, per tweet is a good way to start. Um, uh, whether you're a comedian or just somebody who um, wants to join in the fray of, of uh, millions and millions, hundreds of millions of Twitter users. Um, it's just sort of diving in and being part of it. And the truism is that whatever social media tool you adopt the most um, is the one, well, this is sort of a non-sentence, but <laughs> um, whatever you're part of, whatever community you're part of is gonna be the one that um, you get most, the, the maximum use out of. So in other words, you can friend 700 people on Facebook, but if you never post there, the stuff that you do post is probably not going to get circulated among your friends because you're not regularly in their feeds, you're not part of their conversations, you're not weighing in. Um, I use Facebook a lot. I'm on it all day because as an editor, it's running in the background and when I have to render something, I just look over and you know follow up on conversations or whatever. Twitter, I don't use so much. The, the, the timbre of it is different and it's sort of like the mass of humanity is Twitter. Um, everybody, like I said, from uh, marketing handles to celebrities to everyday um, people who just want to have their voice heard are on there. And so it really is tough to rise above the noise. There's a huge signal to noise ratio. So to become relevant is really a matter of having a strong voice and a very determined creative um, identity that you're putting out there 
um, that identifies with you and people can, identif people can put their finger on, say, oh, that guy does this, I like that, I'm signing up for it so I can get more of it. And also a lot of that is having other people share your content so that it gets shared and that brings eyeballs that you never could. Um, I came into this uh, social media through music and I think that you are really not making any kind of impact until people you don't know are getting your content. If your friends and family come to the show, that you might fill the place once or twice until they're like, all right, he's doing that band thing. Um, whereas suddenly when people you don't know are coming to the shows, you know that you're reaching an audience who is something you're doing is resonating with them. And that same kind of thing goes with social media. Um, uh, so I'm going to do a quick, I, I just made some notes here. I came, I think, I feel like I'm the, uh, uh, what's it called, a uh, uh, cautionary, t I'm the cautionary tale here <laughs> today because this is what you look like if you sit at home doing social media <laughs> all day and that's, I, I didn't, this is actually more dressed up than I usually this am. Could happen to <laughs> I put on a shirt. I, I thought about putting on something nice and I'm like, no, we need to be authentic about this. So, um, I, Coming out of college, I had sort of over. I, I grew up in theater, doing lots of musical theater and uh, plays and that sort of stuff in Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, uh, coming out of college in the Midwest, I had overdosed on um, books about the folk movement of the '60s. So I went to New York City, expecting that to be there, and I was going to be a folk musician and didn't find a burgeoning folk scene there, um, to my surprise. But at that time, the, I mean, the tools at that time. Uh, it was maybe just over the hump from like Tripod and GeoCities and those really, really crappy sort of flashy sites with animated GIFs and stuff. Um, and there were blogs and, you know, these are all sort of your rudimentary tools to say, I matter in this world and I'm going to put my voice out there. So people were adopting, you know, those tools to do that thing. And it's not that much different today. In 2001, where I moved to New York City to do music, there was a site called mp3.com and it was basically like an early MySpace. And um, everybody was on there and it was like, wow, this is where you have to brand yourself and put your photos and get an image out there to, so that people can identify your creative brand. Um, like Terry was saying, you've got to have a brand of some kind, whether you're a musician or just a person who has something to say. Um, do you have a caustic voice like Mark Marin or just a whimsical voice like Weird Al? You know, like you've got to find your thing and then stick with it so that people can identify you. Um, and then as, you know, MySpace exploded in about 2004 through 2006 and then totally tanked as people discovered that it was sort of just like GeoCities, um, really ugly and not especially fun to use and everybody moved to Facebook. And then the, then the, the tools of social media really started exploding in a lot of different directions. Um, Facebook, I mean, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with Facebook, but it really is the best tool for keeping a close network of people that you know. Um, even, when you've, even when you friend people you don't know, I, I don't feel like, uh, first they have a cap of like 5,000 people. So it's not like Twitter where you have, you know, 80 million followers and y you can't interact with 80 million people. You can interact with 700 people um, on Facebook. And, and uh, so that's a very different thing. And then of course LinkedIn is where uh, you present your professional self, whether you're presenting yourself as an actor um, or whatever you do in your professional space aside from acting. Um, and then, um, uh, uh, does anybody here use Tumblr? See, Tumblr is basically a, a very simple and, and effective blogging service that makes, makes your blog look like a museum so that you just can't stop consuming content because it just keeps rolling up and you get lost in this stream of content. And it's, that's been highly adopted by, you know, tweens and teens and that kind of thing. Um, then of course you, you know, if you're doing video or if you're an actor, you need to have a YouTube present where you, presence where you're putting up consistent stuff. All these, all these different things are, um, they're just tools that you can effectively put out your creative brand and say, here's what I am, here's what I do. Um, so um, from there, why do companies get into this? Um, like Terry was saying, they've got to be in it to win it. If they're not controlling the conversation in any way, somebody else is. And the people who are usually moved to talk about a brand are usually the angry ones. And uh, if you've ever, man I, I've managed LinkedIn's, um, both their Facebook and their Twitter handles, and you just, 
people are moved to get on these things because it's the last place that someone can say, I have a voice that counts. And I'm going to spew my bile about your brand because they did me wrong, however, however it happened. You know, maybe it's fair, maybe they're crazy or what, but that's where they go to do it. And so companies have to be in this to play damage control. And, uh, you know, a, a good example of that is, uh, I don't know if you guys followed the progressive dispute where somebody had, uh, progressive had denied somebody's claim after it had killed, uh, his sister was killed in a car accident. So they denied his claim and then forced him to take the other driver to court and then defended that driver in court. So it's a long story, I guess, but the, the summary of it is that that went, exploded on Twitter. Maybe the law, but it's not a good story that way. Um, so it exploded on Twitter and their initial response was to just start tweeting Anybody who tweeted the story, they cut and pasted a tweet. And it was just like their whole Twitter feed filled up with generic robo tweets to anybody who was saying negative things. And it made their brand look really unwholesome and fake and um, didn't do a good thing for Flo, their, their spokeswoman. Um, but anyway, so if, if those, this is the thing that companies have to get into this, uh, you know, swarm of opinions and insights and um, parodies and comedy and whatever, you've got to be, they've got to get into it and they've got to be comfortable and companies then have to find their voice too. Um, they've got to be part of the conversation and their whole thing is, is uh, they have a mandate on the marketing side to engage their audiences too. Um, they have to be putting something out, whether it's tweeting articles that are related to their product or reviews of their product or retweeting people who love their product. They've got to be in this so that they're putting content out there that, um, that uh, engages their audience and reminds them to come back. Um, so engagement is a big thing as opposed to just putting a billboard up and saying people are seeing it. Um, social media is a place where brands engage their audience and that's something for you to be thinking about if you were to get a job in social media. Um, because every character counts when it's 140 characters. So, you know, if you, if you make a 10 word tweet, you've got to make every word something that uh, will make people say, oh, I got to click on that. Um, uh, so it's all about clicks and likes and shares and they're setting up a strategy and then harvesting the data and then al analyzing the data and then refining their strategy. And it's, it's a crazy machine of, a marketing machine of, of uh, data and, and trying to get eyeballs to keep people caring about your brand. I don't know if that's how you want to apply it to your own uh, personal pursuit. I think it's a better thing to just uh, do your art, whatever that may be, whether it's music, comedy, acting, whatever. Do it and be authentic. And I, that I think is may, probably the most important thing for social media, which is you've got to find a voice, whatever that voice is, as I've said in the past, but then you've got to be authentic. And maybe you don't have a voice yet, um, and you're finding your voice as an artist, as an actor, whatever, but the the... The first step is to say, I'm going to be myself, I'm going to be authentic, I'm going to follow passions and tweet and, and post things that I care about because they reflect what's really important to me. Um, and going from there, that's when if somebody comes to find out about you, they're going to be able to go through your social media stream, whether it's Twitter or YouTube. Uh, that's what this person does and that this is what they do best. And um, that voice emerges it can emerge from two or three tweets that you thought were really good. Um, like Terry was saying, it's, it's live, it's current. Your tweet will be viewed, it will only be relevant for about an hour maybe. Um, tweets that aren't seen after an hour are never seen or heard from again. Uh, in very rare cases, you know, like people go back and they look through old social media streams for whatever purpose, but it's a very now thing. It's very something like you put it out at the moment. That's why every event that's happening in the world is a chance for you to brand yourself. What do you have to say about the Super Bowl? Then what do you have to say about um, a Valentine's Day? Then St. Patrick's Day? Then whatever happening in the news, um, that's a chance for you to say, here's my perspective on it, and, and that's what makes me unique. Um, and on the flip side of that, if you don't feel, if you're not someone who wants to say, I'm not the strong personality who says, hey guys, all eyes on me while well, I'm in the room, please, then you have to get good at seeing somebody else's voice. What is Apple's voice? It's that sort of, um, you know, really confident, uh, smirky voice that says, we know we're the best, it's cool. 
And then you would have to get at that. Incidentally, Apple doesn't have a Twitter feed. But um, whatever, your, whatever brands you admire, you might want to look on LinkedIn, go to their company page, see what you can learn about them, and see how you can emulate their voice and then show that company that you can do their voice. Um, because you would have to master their voice because as a social media um, person who's managing their feeds, you're speaking for them. So you have to, you have to get good at that kind of art. Um, and then... Um, Finally, the last thing that you could do in terms of a job in social media is to actually be um, a, a personality, not just who is, is tra you know, putting your voice out there, but is actively making money via creation of social media. Um, an easy way to do it, or an, an easy way to do the opposite is to curate. You're basically retweeting other people. You're saying, here's a cool article. I like this video, whatever, check it out. The opposite of curation is creation, where you're creating your own stuff and saying, this is what I do. A great example of this is uh, Nathan Barnett. Does anybody watch him on YouTube? Um, Nathan Barnett is like uh, this generation's, um, oh, what's his name? The, the, he's a crazy physical comedian. Um, and all of his videos are just him dancing around the world and doing physical comedy. And he was so good at it, he just started making videos that featured Skittles and he became Skittles' social spokesman. So they now give him money and swag and stuff to make videos for him. Um, so if you have such a strong perspective on your own, um, your own uh, gifts or talents or whatever that you can put it out there to the world, you can actually create a context for your own success where people know what you do, people admire what you do, suddenly you're getting gigs for that. Um, from there, let me see if I missed anything. Uh, I think that covers it. I think I'm just going to go a little bit further with you though because sure. uh, one of the things I love about what you've accomplished, Rob, is that you are a musician but you actually, uh, you know, you've worked with LinkedIn, you mm -hmm. still do work with them, and you've worked with Apple, and you've done that. Can you talk a little bit about how you got involved in doing uh, content and sure. uh, doing that kind of work with sure. those places? Sure, and I think that, uh, strangely, this, that sort of, uh, um, I've sort of told the story already in a strange way, which is by getting into this, you show people that you can do it. And you would never get a job being the social media um, uh, marketing team at a small company if you don't have these tools that show I've already done it. Um, unless, unless somehow you were the one who set up the very first feed and you just showed that you could do that for a small company or something like that. But really, they're going to reach out to people. So how did I do it, I guess is the question. Um, really, I got it by marketing my own music on MySpace. And um, at that time, it was a really ugly thing way of going about it, which was friend people, they accept your request, and then you spam their walls mercilessly. <laughs> Just like, here's my new album, here's my new show, we'll be here, you know, like telling someone in Hawaii that you have a show in New York, you know, it doesn't make sense. But um, that's what it, that's what it did and didn't, that's what they were, everybody was doing at the time. And so for about two years, I was on MySpace um, very consistently. And when I moved to California, I was applying for tech jobs. And a friend of mine at LinkedIn said, well, if you're applying down there, maybe you can start doing work for us. So I started doing video work for LinkedIn and making some viral videos and just you know standard testimonial videos. And then eventually I was managing their social media feeds and that kind of stuff. But if I wasn't actively using these tools for the things that I really cared about, like music or um, uh, doing art or photography or whatever, um, I would have had no basis to say, look, I can do this. Um, and moreover, if I was doing it uh, just to sort of, s you have to do it about something you care about or your passion won't show through the tools, you know? Um, so. Uh, through that, I worked at Apple before I worked at LinkedIn, and that sort of showed that I had a tech inclination. Was probably instrumental to getting me hired at uh, at LinkedIn. Um, and since then, I've done. Uh, I still I do edit for uh, broadcast and and um, all kinds of different co tech companies. Um, but either way, the the passion is still in the art and the music, and I'm still striving to create something that um, I actually care about, despite the fact that it's the other stuff that pays the bills. So. <laughs>
I, I also want to just sort of, uh, you know, bring into the fact that, and I hope you're getting this, the idea that, because there's a consistency here about the fact that having, getting your own platform together is really important. Even if you want to go out and look for it, you really need to make sure your LinkedIn and your Facebook and there's a consistency. Is it important too that the pictures are all the same? Do you feel that there needs to be a continuity in that area? I would say that uh, choose your area of, choose your passion and then stick to that. I mean, I think my first blog said something like art, music, tech. And it's like, that's not a very narrow focus. Um, and the narrower you can make your focus, the faster you'll find your audience. You know, TechCrunch was just about tech. Um, and they became the biggest tech blog. Um, and uh, even, if it's, even if it's a complete sub-niche, um, like there's a fan fiction blog about um, Jesse Eisenberg and what's his name, Garfield, that write fan fiction about those two actually being boyfriends in real life. And so they have a very active subculture that's doing that um, uh, because that's what those people care about. And the strangest thing about the media landscape is that, um, you know, there used to be three channels and in every town there were maybe ten radio stations. And now you can listen to every radio station in the world and watch every channel that's on and TiVo every channel. So every market place of media is completely fractured into just its most passionate fans. And so you've got to create something that's pretty narrow to say, hey guys, I'm just doing this. If you don't have an especially strong creative voice, you can say, I'm just going to blog about what's happening at LACMA because I love LACMA. I'm just going to write about the events and say, go and write what I saw and uh, maybe shoot some pho photos with my phone and then people will start checking your blog to see oh, what's happening at LACMA. You know, like whatever your passion is, make it narrow and, and key in on that and then out of that comes you. Okay, next up is Bonnie Ebner who I've told you she's the director of uh, Bebner uh, Creative Management and Photography. Uh, Bonnie's social uh, media expertise, and I don't know if I should use the word expertise now, uh, <laughs> is utilized by companies all over the country. Bonnie launched the social media networking framework for the Los Angeles Children's uh, Orchestra, established project management structure, and source talent for uh, InnoBoom Advertising Agency, and produced photographs for Sweet. So she's done an amazing amount, and I think what's so amazing is you keep a photography career going at the same time. So why don't you let us know a little bit about you? Well, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be up on this panel. Um, I definitely work on a smaller scale, on a freelance scale, and I Bonnie, start bring, it, bring your mic a little oh, bit closer. Oh, sorry. I started off in school um, doing a business degree. I actually have an, an undergraduate degree in international economics, and it was very dry, and it was very boring. And I thought, this is what I need to do, this is what I have to do, but I had this, this like longing to be an artist. I always had a passion inside to be an artist. So then I went on to get an MFA in photography because Harvard Business Review had written this whole article on how the MFA was the new MBA, and I thought, well, it's a fail-safe, right? <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> so <laughs> I ended up working in marketing. I worked in-house, and then I worked in an agency, and then my husband decided to collect some degrees, so he moved me across the United States, and I had to do something different for work because I was moving from city to city to city um, from East. And, um, and that passion for photography that keeps coming up and saying, don't forget about me, please, you know, please pursue me still. And so I've, I've come up with a way to continue doing those things. And I think I'm just to talk more about the nuts and bolts of um, that kind of freelance marketing world, because I think that a multidisciplinary approach in that world is necessary. And I think that all of you probably have a lot of creative talents that can contribute to that field. Um, so I think it's very valuable, the assets that you have, and I think it's ap applicable. Um, and so I'm just going to go through my recommendations, and they're just nuts and bolts things. Um, first, to lay a strong foundation for yourself. Second, discover your strengths. Third, build your business. And this is just if you want to get into this as a freelance career for yourself. Um, one of the things for a great foundation that I find to be true, you know, through and through, is to brush up on your copywriting skills. I had no idea how much copy I would be writing um, day after day, grammar, copy. I mean, it, it really is the, um, the key, I think, to, 
to getting the word out in social media in an efficient, effective way, um, especially on Twitter, you don't have that many words. You want to say something efficient, effective for your client, for yourself. It's really a great thing to brush up on. Um, and the second thing, and this might be really small talk, but is to brush up on your business affairs. If you're going to be collecting clients, think about how you're going to track your hours. Think about how you're going to invoice them. Think about how you're going to pay your taxes. Think about the expenses that you're incurring to do these things. And keep track of those things because when it comes time to, you know, at the end of the year to do your taxes, these things are all relevant suddenly. And maybe we don't think of them in the beginning and then we lose out on some opportunities there. Um, and then if these things make you uncomfortable, I recommend taking a class, getting a book at the library. The library has so many resources, especially grammar books. They have wonderful grammar books that are easy and fun to read because grammar might not be fun for everyone. Um, <laughs> it might just be me, my guilty pleasure. Um, <laughs> so, so anyhow, once you've gotten kind of these nuts and bolts things together, um, discover what it is that you have to bring to the table. Do you know how to use Photoshop? Can you use InDesign? Can you lay things out? Um, can you take photographs? Are you a great writer? Can you build websites? There might be a hundred different things that are running through your head right now and you think, well, yeah, I can do that or I'm good at this and I, I didn't think that would be applicable. These are all gifts that you can offer your potential clients. If you have something outside of just, you know, writing a sound bite, if you can offer photography as a skill, which I've been happy and, and you know, fortunate to be able to do, or if you can build a website, or if there's just something else you can bring to the table, that's a gift to your client. And it's something that you can use to expand your breadth in social media. Um, and then build your business. Prepare a portfolio of your work put it all together online, or even have it physically, and create a boilerplate for yourself. A boilerplate is something that, you know, we put on the bottom of press releases for companies and that kind of thing, but make one for yourself. A little sound bite, it's sometimes called like an elevator pitch, something that you can say to someone, to a potential client, to a friend, about your skills, about the things that you can offer people, um, and that you're comfortable with, and that you can say on the spot because I think that's very helpful when you meet a potential client to know the skills, the exact skills that you can offer and as Rob said, refine that, that thing that it is that you do that you can offer so that you can tell people that instantly. Um, and develop a list of potential clients. This is often the hardest thing to do is to start generating income for yourself through your skills. And that can start with just a, a local search of local businesses in your area. I work with small businesses. I don't have any huge clients, but they pay my bills. So I'm happy to have them. And I look um, around, I ask my friends, I ask uh, people I've worked with in the past, and then I do a search of local businesses in the area that I think I could help. And then approach them, be nice to them, tell them, hey, I love what you're doing. I happen to notice I, there's a chocolate shop down the street from me and she sends the most horrid emails. And they just have <laughs> this little attachment and it doesn't open ever and you have to like try to open it and put it in a new program to open it. And because I love her, I do it. Otherwise I delete it. Um, so I, <laughs> I went up to her. I saw her at a, a street fair and I said, listen, I'd like to help you with this. <laughs> Because I love you, I'd like this to grow. So, I mean, look for those people. Those people need help too. And, and they oftentimes have a budget and it's a good place to start. You know, if you need it to generate income for yourself and that's kind of like when I hit the ground in the new city that my husband brings me to, I have to hustle. And so that's what I do. And I go and I try to find these places that might need my help, that I can help um, and generate, start generating income. And from there I get bigger clients, relatively bigger clients that can pay me more and more and so on and so forth. Um, but if you're having trouble finding that client, that first, that first step, volunteer. That's a wonderful thing that I've done in the past too. Go someplace where you feel like your talent can be used, you can be altruistic, you can feel good about it, and then you can also build your skill and build the um, audience for your, for your skill. And chances are someone in that, uh, in that arena is gonna say, hey, I like what you're doing, can you help me here? Or I have a friend that might be able to use your help. I love, I love the website you built for so-and-so. I love the photographs you took for so-and-so. It's a really great way to get your foot in the door if this is something brand new um, that you're just starting to try to do. Um, so, 
Anyhow, I, I think social media can mean so many different things. It can be as simple as helping to establish a business. It can be informative. It can be entertaining. It can be visual. Um, I think you just need to find what it means to you and how you can move forward um, within that channel and, and do your best at, at um, accomplishing what you'd like to do within it. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, I think we should applaud them. Just to add on, it's just wonderful. I mean, can you get feeling of yourself starting from the beginning and starting to kind of process how you would put this together? Um, one thing I, I would be interested in, and I, I'm sure the, the audience would as well, um, in terms of building your social media, do you have like, I mean, what I see in reading your bio, and I would think a bio is really important, just having something that really speaks about what you do and what you've done. But did you start set up short-term goals and then long-term goals? Like, do you have any sense of where you want to end up going with this eventually? Well, yes, that's a good question. Um, it's funny because my husband, he makes me, every um, six months we do, we set up new goal sheets and they're short-term <laughs> and long-term. They're kind of cheesy. I, I do one column, he does the other column. Um, but yeah, I do. I set up short-term and long-term goals for myself because otherwise it's very easy to lose sight of these things that we think we'd like to do. Um, and, and when they're on a list, and when, especially if you have someone else to do it with, if you have a friend, if, I mean anyone, anyone that will do that second column with you that's going to hold you accountable. Because what he does is he says, I did my number one, did you do yours? <laughs> and I say, no, but I did my number five, you know? <laughs> So daily anyone, to do list. So yeah. <laughs> also, you. And then I say, and I did your laundry. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I knew it for you. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, but no, I mean, I think it's someone to hold you accountable to these things. Um, and yeah, I try to, to look. I look. I found one in, in an old book I was reading. I found a really old, short term, long term list, and I looked at it and I thought, whoa. I actually did all that stuff by now because it was that old and I felt really good. But it is really easy to lose sight of these small steps. And so I keep a list. I do keep a daily list, actually. I do it the night before so I can sleep at night because um, <laughs> otherwise there's too much anxiety. Yeah, it's like emptying your head so that you can go to sleep and then the next day you know what you've got to do. Right, it's a go list. So um, I, I think it's crucial, and I, I, for me at least, um, and I, I think it's a really good idea to visualize where you can see yourself Break it off into chunks that are digestible. Don't put something on your list that's like that's huge and really can't be accomplished. Break it off into those tiny, tiny steps where you know you can check it off within that within that time period. We have the most micro to do list at the office. Like it is so <laughs> micro. You know, turn your computer on. Hey, done. <laughs> but but we we find that was the only way to achieve the big goals is to look down and say this big goal took 14 steps and we got all those steps done. And so by the time we're done with the goal, we're like, ah, who cares? Because we turned our computer on, number one. It, 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 they call that slicing the salami, you know, it's, it's just one little thin piece at a time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I always think that it, sometimes we just want to get up and make a copy on a Xerox machine because you, you, you start something, you complete it, it's done, and it does it, you know, everything else you still have to get done. Um, one of the things I do want to mention, some of you have used this, uh, we have a good collaboration with uh, uh, the uh, College of the Canyon Small Business Development, and if you're uh, somebody who really wants to do something like that this as a business, especially if you live in the valley, but although they'll take people outside of the valley now. Um, they had gotten a $100,000 uh, grant to help people in the entertainment industry start small businesses. So that's one way to go. And we have flyers, I think, here. I don't know what, what, the, what table it's on, but we're supposed to have flyers and, and information. Over there? Okay. And uh, the other one is, uh, for those who live on the west side, Santa Monica College has a small business development. You can get counseling for free, and classes are like $20 or $30 for a class to learn how to do a, uh, a business plan or, you know, having to work that out. Because these things, they are hard to do by yourself, and it's good to have that place where you can weigh in and see if you're doing all the tasks that you need to do to make this business get going. Jerry, may I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, um, I'm still curious about before Serena does her, gives her presentation. How many people are here who are here are here for the reason to start their own social media business? 
Okay, how many people are here to learn how to use social media for their own career development and to get discovered and all that stuff? You, you realize you literally took away the intro of my, oh, my talk. I had no idea. I, mean, I, I, I don't know what, I've been really quiet, right guys? I, like, I read really your brain, quiet. I read your mind. And I know Beverly, I know where you work. Mm -hmm. Well, that should make it easier for you, easier yeah. to say. So. How many of you would, if you could find a sideline job, Maybe it wasn't your own business, but you would maybe work for a company that would use you for that. How many of you would do that? So that's another area. So maybe it's not your own business, but maybe you're working for, and this really is a great intro for Serena, because Serena. I'm so ready to talk. I can't I know. Understand. I don't even know. I don't even I know if I. freaking out, people. Should I even introduce no. you, or do you, okay. You, you, you guys, you do it. I'm you Serena. Do it. That's no. it. Oh, no. I, I just want to say a little bit, but Serena, you, you know, Serena comes from another area, because Serena works with public relations companies, and she works for organizations that do it, but she does her own thing. And I want to tell a teeny tiny story that one, I was trying to get, I was trying to get Rob to come. Rob couldn't come. Rob said, oh, you got to, Serena, she'd be great. Of course, Serena wasn't Blame available. Rob. But Serena said to me, what do you need? You know, and I said, I need somebody for to talk about advertising. And she said, can I tweet for you? I said, tweet away. In five minutes, I had something like 18 emails telling me that these people that were interested in could come and speak for me. I can't even tell you how long it takes to find speakers. You don't even want to know about it. But it was remarkable. And they were all good people. You know, that was what's so amazing. So that was our introduction. And uh, Serena uh, looks at it. And she's also the president of uh, social, I, I'm making her crazy, crying. social media in Los Angeles. And I think if I say one more word, she's going to throw her microphone at me. So I'm going to introduce me, Serena. Me, 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 me. Hi, everybody. The most important phrase and word in social media. Me. <laughs> okay, I got to say that everybody said, like, all the, whole, the whole time you guys were talking, I was like, yes, yes, I wanted to say that, yes. So I, I just have random notes to say, but I wanted to say a couple things, and I'm glad, actually, really glad that you asked that question, because that was, that was really on my mind. Because there really are two things. One of the things about social media, and this is for people who are looking to, to get a job, and then people who want to do this for a living, is you have to, you really need to just jump in. If you want to do this for a living, and you don't have any experience yet, you are your own case study. You're starting your platforms at zero, and you're growing your own platforms using tools and techniques that you would learn to do for business. So use yourself as a, you sh you're the perfect case study. Um, if you're looking for social media for a job, there are a lot of tools out there. Um, so quick, if you're looking to start your own business, one thing I did want to recommend is there's a site called DocStock. It's D-O-C-S-T-O-C. And DocStock just launched a free small business um, tools and training session. And it's a startup that started in Los Angeles. So these people, Jason, is, I actually used to work there. And these are people who actually know what it's like to try to start your own business. They're a small business trying to help other companies create, grow, and, and, and be. So these are people who actually know exactly what you're going through. And the advice that you're going to get is exactly what you, you know, it's really applicable versus just pie in the sky advice. Uh, okay, I'm going to jump in. Whew. So my, I'm a social media success story. <laughs> I did not do social media before social media really came around. I played on the web, I had a job, and so I was on the internet all day goofing off, reading chats rooms, days of our lives, kept up with that for years because of a blog. And then I realized like the job I was in, which was a newswire industry, this industry was gonna die. It's news, it's just like the creative space. What's happened to the creative space? The web is a wonderful place to share and make content, but you have to do it for free. So what people were paying you previously to do, the web is now offering other people for free. You created a movie. People pay, used to pay to go to a movie. Now you can watch clips online. You can go to YouTube and watch as many videos as you'd like all day long for free. So what it's really done is it's really create, killed the creative services industry. It, it has, hands down. You got, I mean, look at artists. A really good friend of mine is Dave Dorman. He's a comic artist. And he cannot get a job. Why? Because people can Google and get his artwork and look at it all day long. They don't need to buy the painting anymore. They can make it their screensaver. So in the creative space, you've really got to work hard now to, to make money. Now, it can be done because as everybody was saying here, the one thing Los Angeles has that nobody else has, nobody in the entire world has, is, is you guys. It's, we call it Sillywood. It's Silicon Valley meets Hollywood. And nobody has the creative understanding of what it takes to engage an audience than the people sitting in this room. 
So it's really what we're doing now is we're no longer selling your, necessarily your art, we're selling your brains. Now you have the opportunity to really just sell your brains and your knowledge. So the first thing you want to do, if you want to look at starting a social platform, it's creating your social presence because you are your own social media success story. And when I said I'm a social media success story, the, literally the n only reason why all y'all know me, well, you don't know me yet, you know me because I'm crazy, but the only reason most people know me is my Twitter handle is Serena. It's my first name. It looks really impressive. How did I get on Twitter? A few years ago, a friend of mine sent me an email and the email said, Serena, you're an asshole. I was like, oh, first off, I'm at work, you can't use that kind of language in my office. But secondly, I'm not an asshole. And so I wrote back and said, why? He said, you're not on Twitter. I didn't know what he was talking about, but I didn't want to be an asshole, right? So I was like, I don't know what it is. So I signed in and they said, pick your name. And all my friends had their, AIM, their AOL screen names as their names. I'm Dr. Pepper, I'm Joe Schmo, I'm so-and-so. Well, Serena doesn't have a nickname. Serena rhymes with Perina, and I am not using a dog food nickname like I did when I was a kid. So I just signed up with my real name, and that was the reputation builder. Everybody saw me on a social platform having my first name, and that's why people thought I knew what I was doing. I was tweeting. What was I doing? I was stealing Beverly Macy's information and sending it out. I was following experts and retweeting their news. I didn't know what I was doing. This wasn't my knowledge yet, yet. But I was sharing other people's news. And what happened is, is that people were following, for example, Beverly Macy. I'll just use her as an example. Beverly sends out a lot of great content. My, I would look at her news and I would write my own little header. Dude, this is an amazing article. You better save this. Read this right now. Or this is ridiculous. But I would just put my own little header on their news. And what I found was people would go to Beverly's site to get the, the headline, but they came and they were following me to get my, my thought on it my, this sucks, this is great. And then they were like, Serena says it's great, it must be great, and they were sharing it on. And I know I'm just sort of going off talking about me, but it was a very interesting start. Now, why did I pick Twitter as my first social network? Because I love words. I'm a word person. I learn by reading, I love to write. I'm not a really good writer, but I like to do it, so I used Twitter. If I was a photographer, I would be on Instagram. If I was a video creator, I would be on YouTube. So you pick your platform based on your expertise. The other platforms you can sign up for and use it to help share your information out. So I will use Twitter to tweet out Instagram photographs, sharing my content now over so different networks. But really, or I'll use Facebook to include a link and a photograph. Photos on Facebook, huge. If you're trying to get interaction on Facebook, add a photograph. Hands down, Facebook, add a photo. But what you really want to do is you want to pick the platform that matches your content. And then you just want to start creating content. And I have a, a female friend of mine who just started writing a mommy blog. There are 8 million mommy blogs out there. There's no way you're going to cut through the clutter on mommy blogs. But she did something really smart. She joined mommy blog networks. And they all promote each other. And this is actually what I was going to say. One of the reasons why I was able to get influential early is I created a network. Every one of you guys in this room should know each other. You should be sharing your information. And when one of you, when you're creating a video and sending it out, you should write a tweet and a Facebook update. And you should be sending it out to each other saying, hey guys, can you tweet this for me? Can you share this for me? That is how everything else is being done in this world. People aren't just tweeting something and all of a sudden it goes viral. They're not putting up a video and all of a sudden it gets two million views. They're seeding it out by having their friends share it. That's called influence. If you want to be an influencer, what that means is when you share news, people act. When I tweet out saying, hey, someone, we need a speaker, you got response. But an influencer is who can generate more attention and drive in traffic. The absolute hands down best way for you guys to help each other out is share each other news. Be willing to tweet each other's news. Of course, it has to be relevant. You know, if you write a blog, a Christian blog, you're not going to write about 50 grades of shades of gray. <laughs> Well, you might, but it's not going to be the same article. <laughs> but you know what I mean? You want to make sure you're sharing out relevant information, but hands down, the best thing you can do. Because think about it. When you hear of something really cool, back in the day, you used to call your friends, go to a cocktail party, share that piece of news. Now you post it on Facebook, or you might email it with your friends. You really want to be able to share it out. And I'm sorry, I'm jumping around. I'm going to tell you a couple of things. So platforms. If you're a textual person, Twitter is perfect for you. Twitter is a news service. It is a news feed. As everybody said here, once your tweet goes out, three minutes later, it cannot be found. 
That's why you start to see people repeating and retweeting all day long. There's a really good app that will help you space out your tweets. If you're like me and really only have 15 minutes a day to play on Twitter, you don't want to tweet out 45 articles and then not come back on until 15 hours. So Buffer app, B-U-F-F-E-R app. <laughs> I see someone shake my hand, I'm like, you know. It's great. It actually will auto time out all of your, your tweets for you. If you are a, a photo person, we did talk about Flickr and Instagram. One way you can make money off your photos, photos is sign up for InstaCanvas. InstaCanvas is a brand new startup here in Los Angeles that actually will take your, your Instagram photo and make it a purchasable, they'll actually, someone can come in and buy from, from InstaCanvas and they'll take your photo, put it on a canvas and send it to them and you split the profits. So right off the bat, you can start making, no, it's not the best way for you to make money, but it's a great way to sort of start getting your name out there. You might also want to look at DeviantArt and showcase your artwork in DeviantArt, which is a, so an art social network. And it's a great place. Etsy, another great place to sell artwork. What was DeviantArt? Deviant. Deviant. Yeah, it's D-E-V-I-A-N-T-A-R-T. It always sounds like I'm saying something yeah. wrong. Um, Etsy, E-T-S-Y. It's a, it's a uh, craft site that sells crafts, but it's a fabulous place to sell art. And Etsy's really interesting. If you have a, a, a visual eye and you can design a really pretty layout of your front page of Etsy, which will make sense when you go to there. Etsy, they, throughout the day, they actually go and find pretty front pages and then they feature them. So I have a friend who every month, at least once a month, is featured on the front page of Etsy and sells out of all of her product at full price. So Etsy's a great place where you can sell. If you do video, of course, YouTube, Vimeo, there are other places you can, you can do video. The nice thing about video, especially on YouTube, is you can annotate it. Every time you upload something into YouTube, play around with the tools. Use tags. Really get that visibility. There are a lot of people out there. There's something called VidCon, V-I-D-C-O-N. It's an annual conference of YouTubers. Uh, I, Justine, she's a YouTube uh, celebrity. I like to use quotes a lot. She's a YouTube celebrity. She started a few years ago just doing tech reviews. She's now averaged about $100,000. She gets paid to do three videos for Mattel, for, I, for Barbie, for Tech Barbie. So she's getting paid an average about $100,000 per engagement per company that she works with. So people are making real money. But how they did it was by getting views on YouTube. And I, Justine. Like iPod, iPhone. Exactly. She started out as the original Apple fangirl. Mm -hmm. And they found her. There's also something very popular right now on YouTube called haulers, which are, it's really big in the teen set, where they go shopping, and then they cut, the girls come back, and they show everything they purchased from a particular store, Kohl's or Target or whatever. These girls are now being paid to go shopping and come back and show it. You can get paid to do anything on YouTube if you integrate a brand with it. So always think about brands, brands you like though. Our brands you don't like. Lots of uh, taste test YouTubes too, where they just eat snacks or something, and then the snack companies start sending them yep. snacks. So there's a, there's a lot of ways to, to get visible, but the trick for getting visible is getting views, right? Or retweets or shares, and you have to have a network to do it. These YouTubers, these million view YouTubers, they, they all network with each other, these VidCon stars, so that when, when, when one posts a video, they all promote it. That's how these guys are making millions of dollars. And it's just by sharing it out. That's why I'm really stressing the network. And I'm using my hands a lot. Um, Tumblr is a real, oh yeah, hi. Yeah, there are starting to be agencies where that you, YouTubers are having agents, but they won't really talk to you until you have a certain set number of views. And really the only way to get those views is to get, is to seed it out there. I'm gonna give you a quick trick for YouTube views, actually for anything. Facebook has become a pay-for-play platform. You know how you might follow a brand on Facebook and sometimes you see them in your feed when you go into Facebook? Well, what's happened on Facebook is now only 16% of all brand posts are actually visible in Facebook unless you pay. So the trick is, do, YouTube just launched two weeks ago where you can now, as a person, pay $7 for, for any post you put on Facebook, and it will promote it to your friends. So if you're doing a YouTube video, pay that $7. Or do 10, if you have a YouTube, if you have a Facebook page that you're trying to promote, do $10 a day for local advertising, the visibility is outrageous. Outrageous, she said. 
<laughs> but paying to, paying to advertise on Facebook is now the only way brands get visibility on Facebook. So if you want to promote something on Facebook, you can do it through your brand and pay $10 a day. Or you can do it through your personal page and pay $7 for a post. But paying on Facebook, you, you need to know that. That's, be, that's big. We're, we're not, we're not oh, doing questions. Sorry, yet. guys. Everybody, we're doing uh, questions on cards. So if you have questions, just write them out on the card, and I'm going to read them, OK? And I'm sorry. I will, I'll go super fast. Um, Tumblr, great site. The problem with Tumblr is that Tumblr doesn't have any search engine optimization, which means if I have a massive Tumblr page and I go in and search for Serena Ehrlich, it doesn't show up. So you really want to make sure that if you're doing a serious blogging, use WordPress, and then repurpose your content over Tumblr. That's a great thing about all these social networks is you can share the content. So you can create one piece of content. You could take a fantastic photograph and put five different captions on it and put it in five different places and get five different types of responses. You can also from that test to see what works best. But content is, your, is, your, is what you own. Content, uh, well, I'll get into that in a second. Sorry. I'm so excited. OK. I, saw, I stole this from Rob because he didn't say it, and I waited. Quora. Quora and LinkedIn Answers. If you want to build your reputation, LinkedIn Answers is the best place. Quora is the second best place. These are people who ask questions on every single topic you can think of. When you answer, you get a point for being an expert. Who hired, when you hire somebody, what are you hiring? The worst person or are you hiring the expert? You're hiring the expert. So LinkedIn and, uh, and Quora take 15 minutes a day and just go in, find a question you can answer, answer it. If you blog, take that question and answer, put it on your blog and, and intro it like this. I saw this question on LinkedIn and I thought you would really like to know what I, my answer. So here you go. And now you've just repurposed content and created blog. But answering these, creating a reputation in these expert sites, super easy to do. Only answer the questions you know, right? And you look fabulous. And Quora is actually populated with very well-known experts in, in every industry. I posted a question about how you could find the axis of a foreign planet on a distant star, and the NASA expert wrote back and said, we don't know how to do that yet. <laughs> You're sticking it to the man. <laughs> we, For call, free. we call that trolling. No, um, Q-U-O-R-A. Okay, so last thing, we talked a little bit about creating your voice in social media. I just wanted to quickly say that your voice is whatever you want it to be. Social media is the opportunity for you to rebrand yourself in whatever you want to rebrand yourself in. It really is. Nobody knows what your past is in social. You're only, you, only, you only are what you appear online. You're no longer who you are. You're no longer a great person. You're no longer fun. When you're looking for a job, you're only who you are online. If they can't find you, that's bad. If they can find you and it's nothing but naked pictures, unless you're a porn star, that's bad. <laughs> uh, all your social profiles never ever post a photograph of you drinking alcohol. It's not because I don't drink. It is because if you go to a party and you take a photo with your iPhone and you post it on Facebook and you have a friend who's got a beer in their hand and they have a car accident on the way home, you can now be sued. The insurance companies now have permission to go in and take your photo. Not you can be sued, but, but they can find your photograph. Anyway, no alcohol photos. Mm -hmm. Really big deal. Don't just hide them. Make them private. Um, but make sure that when you're recreating yourself online and you're picking your voice, how do you pick your voice? Your voice is based on what your goal is. If you want to be the expert in toilet paper, then you better speak like the expert in toilet paper. If you want to be a really fun comic writer, comedic writer, be comedic. If you're trying to be dramatic, be dramatic. If you're a horror writer, be horrifying. <laughs> but you pick who you are online, and you create the content that matches that. I know there's a lot of discussion about being authentic and be this, but really it's about being who you want to be online. Because I'm crazy. But if you look at me online, I'm kind of normal. <laughs> but I created that. Um, and last thing here are the tools to know. When I'm hiring an intro-level social media person, this social media person must know not only how to write, fantastic point by the way, and being able to write in 140 characters and driving an action, huge. They have to know Google Analytics. They have to know Google AdWords. They have to know how to create and run a Facebook ad campaign. They have to know minimal graphic design work. They have to know WordPress. And they have to know how to deep search on Google. And that is my entry level intern has to know that information. 
I don't know all that information. That's why I'm hiring someone who's doing it, but I don't. That's how social media has evolved. It started out as a content creation. It started out as being under, able to tell a story. It started about being able to write a headline, and now you have to know the rest of this stuff. All of these things that I just told you, you can take tutorials. They're all easy to do. You can even get certified online in Google AdWords. Huge for your resume. Because people really don't understand that social, when you're, when you're working for business, social is now social with a, it has to drive to ROI. In the beginning, it was, we're Skittles and we're on Facebook. Now it's, we're Skittles, we're on Facebook and buy Skittles, right? It's no longer about the awareness and the happiness of being on these social channels. It's about driving an action. So if you can understand the Google AdWord world, hands down, you're ahead of your, your competition in, in interviews. Good Lord. Did I, I don't even... No, no, no. You, you, you blew it. I blew it. I'm out, guys. <laughs> and lastly, can I just quickly say no, a couple no, people, uh, a couple people to follow on Twitter. Hayden Black. I don't know if you guys know Hayden Black. He's a writer. Super funny. He's a comedic writer, and his Twitter feed has actually landed him major jobs. He just got it, finished a job with BBC, uh, a comedic job. He'd never been in their radar until they saw his Twitter feed. And it shows you an idea. Polly Shore does amazing content. He's just doing politics right now. He's doing a whole election thing. But if you look and see what he's done, it's pretty incredible. And it's just Polly. Polly and like three interns. And then last thing, Mike Rotman, R-O-T-M-A-N on Twitter. It's Mike and then R-O-T-M-A-N. Another fabulous writer. And just somebody to give you an idea of like other people in this industry who are using their social channels to get writing jobs or to support writing jobs or to get new business. Done. Did you report oh. oh, yes, yes. Absolutely. Google Ad Analytics. Google AdWords. Facebook ads, graphic design, just intro, but being able to like make a logo or a short ad if you need to, WordPress, how to set up a blog, and then I would say deep Google searching. And there are very certain things you can do in Google in the search field, like you can put in your name and then put site, mogreet.com, and only search within one site. If you know how to do these search tricks on Google, your life will be a lot easier. I didn't know, by the way, my Called first job. Boolean. My first job, oh, you believe it. My first job, somebody asked me if I did, oh, yeah, I know how to do that. They walked in, it was up on uh, Wikipedia, how to do it. I was trying, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's good to be oh. resourceful. <laughs> yeah, it, trust me, that, that trick, oh, and SlideShare, slideshare.net. Anything you need to know, it's in SlideShare. Anything. I need slideshare.net, so it's S L I D E S H A R E.net. They're actually tied into LinkedIn. So one of the things I do after each of my presentations, so I'll do it today, is I'll go home and make a little PowerPoint of what I talked about, and then I put it in SlideShare, and it gets all this SEO, and I look really smart. But actually, it was just me stealing what they just talked about. <laughs> and I look really good. But SlideShare. SlideShare has, is nothing but places people store textual content and how you can go in and search. So you can search for social media plans for the comedy store, and it is in there in full detail. Social media strategies for comedians. It's in there. Anything you could possibly think that you want. It's like, it's like, uh, power, it's like the YouTube of PowerPoint presentations. And you can get work from those, too. Because one of my friends did one on, um, on ethics in advertising. And some corporations found his SlideShare presentation. And he was going off to the Cayman Islands to do a presentation. So you can get actual work from that stuff. Yeah. And Rob, what was the name you, just, you were saying? You just put in the title of the uh, The... Boolean. Boolean. Oh, Boolean logic is a kind of search, uh, yeah, where you can say, show me everything that says um, Facebook and Zuckerberg, and it's only things that have those two things. Uh, or you could say Facebook, not Zuckerberg, so that you only get things about the site and not about the founder, etc. It's, it's B-O-O-L-E-N. Not like Booyan. <laughs> it's Booyan. No, it, Not it's like a, it's Booyah, a, like a shotgun. So, <laughs> obviously, so the reason we're telling you all these search tips or YouTube tips or all this is because social media is the only industry of this magnitude of success that actually was founded and run while the internet was up and running. So from the very beginning of social media, one of the very first things we all learned was share it. Remember this? Uh, if you learn it, share it. Everything you could possibly want to know about social media is actually online and easy to find and almost always pre-written for you. 
You need a crisis communications plan? Google that. I guarantee you can pull up the American Red Cross complete crisis communication plan, download it, and use it yourself. Social media put everything online. Every tool you could possibly want, wills, every knowledge base. Wills. Uh, legal wills. documents, all kinds of stuff. Everything is online. There's legal Zoom, all the Rocket Lawyer. There's all kinds of places like that where you can go get legal docs. And yeah. It's all out there. I want to just, um, one of the things that you guys all brought up, uh, is, it, you, you mentioned it and everybody might not know what it means here, but SEO, uh, because I think it's so important for people to, do you guys all understand what SEO is? How many of you don't? Okay, so there's a, there's a good number that doesn't. Um, it means uh, search engine optimization and uh, what's, what's important can I, about... Can I tell my quick thing on SEO? Sure, sure, go ahead. I'll, I'll tell you this. So the, if think of the web, the entire internet, as a filing cabinet. And by the way, I told my 13-year-old niece this. She listened to the entire thing and then said, what's a filing cabinet? But the entire... <laughs> it's true. Every piece of content on the web, think of it as a filing cabinet. Almost every piece of content on the web is untagged or uncategorized. So when you... Search engine optimization is you're searching that filing cabinet. And search engine optimization is optimizing your name so that when somebody searches your name in this massive filing cabinet, your stuff comes up. So if I went in and just searched Serena, you're going to get a bazillion things that say Serena, unless I'm really careful and I make sure that as frequently as possible, I insert my name. Or Serena Ehrlich now, obviously, because the internet, apparently there's more than one Serena. But Serena Ehrlich, so I make sure that my name can be found, so I put my name everywhere. And that's, you do a very smart thing by having your name being your social channels. And to add to that, if you want to learn about um, search engine optimization or more about Twitter and any of the, of the things that we're talking about, if you go, you go to YouTube, go to Common Craft, search C-O-M-M-O-N, and then the word C-R-A-F-T, and they do great little visuals that are about three minutes or five minutes long that explain these new platforms and channels very easily and very clearly. And you can play them back until you really understand them. So it's a very good learning tool, and that's one of the good things about YouTube. Right. No, that's, that's really good. And the other thing, I mean, I always like to say, uh, I, uh, some people know this story, but I, I, my name is Joanne Webb. And for a while, uh, about, you know the story, about four years ago, um, a wo longer, about five or six years ago, a woman in Texas got uh, arrested for um, selling sex toys. Uh, uh, and uh, and her name was Joanne Webb. <laughs> so, so for a very long time, she t covered two pages of. Uh, if you looked up Joanne Webb, two pages was just this Joanne Webb. You know, so it took a while. But now, if you looked me up, you, if you said Joanne Webb career con, or if you said Joanne Webb, I'd now still you have be to dig that. to find out that you have a conviction for sex. <laughs> exactly, choice. exactly. You have to really go to about you know twelve pages before you find out. So you can you can bury things very easily uh, on your SEO as well. <laughs> Yeah, you're absolutely right. Creating accounts and tagging and making sure your name is everywhere absolutely buries bad news. I know some of you are happy to hear that. And also joining different Google networks, obviously. Absolutely. If you are on a Gmail account, getting a Gmail account, getting on Google Voice, getting on a, ver a, a YouTube account, all that stuff uh, brings you up as well. It can hurt also if you have a, a name that's... Uh, if you ha to squat, basically squat on the properties with your handle. If you're not going to necessarily use Twitter yet, but you have a name that hasn't been claimed, go up, sign up, you've got it, and when you're ready to start tweeting, you have it before somebody else just grabs it because everything under the sun is basically taken, and that's why I think web companies come up with crazy ways to spell things and say things. Yeah. Great, great. Um, we've talked about SEO. Why don't you give me some of the cards, and we'll we'll get some of these questions going. While well, you're looking at the, the cards, uh, can I say something here? Oh my God. I think uh, Serena is very exactly on target about keeping her name as Serena, and and then about what everybody else has said here about going with what you know. And if you're a photographer, or if you're in everything you can tell that's visually. Um, uh, able to relate visually is your story. Like if you're a makeup artist, you can do tutorials, visual tutorials on Pinterest or how to's on YouTube. If you go into YouTube and you s just write in how to, everything in the world will come up, stuff you don't even want to know. But, but for all of you and what you do in your craft, it can be about hair, it can be about makeup, it can be about photography or lighting, anything at all. So if you think about even from the how-to perspective, uh, Pinterest, Instagram, so on, you, you really got some content. And it's good to know that YouTube is the second largest search engine after Google. So 
People are searching YouTube for everything that you can think of. Um, what, not just like videos, but also music, and then how-tos, and then, um, you know, I have a rash. Let's see what, if there's anything like WebMD said on YouTube or whatever. So like, everything related to life, people are now engaging with YouTube because videos are a, a, an easy way to engage as opposed to shuffling through text and trying to find an answer that way. I also learned that if you can't do something with your phone, your iPhone, you can't figure it out, and you can't get somebody over at Apple, go on to YouTube, and there's somebody in Wisconsin, you know, some geek in Wisconsin that will tell, 10-year-old, who will tell you how to do it. You know, it's, it's kind of amazing, uh, you know, you know what I'm saying. Oh, and, and one last thing, in this whole, in this area of creating content and being your, you know, being who you are, if you're a heavily technical person, technical knowledge is really needed on the web. Yeah. Lots of people, if you think about a news source like CNN, CNN will write a story about a gas leak, but CNN doesn't know anything about gas leaks. They know exactly what they researched out. So when people are looking to follow up on the gas leak, they really want to speak to someone who actually knows in the gas industry. And I know that has nothing to do with here, but if you're doing technology, especially with the start of, especially special effects and technology being moving to China, take this opportunity to really become the expert in special effects because you may not be selling to the Hollywood industry anymore, but you might be selling to the at-home video creation industry more, and you might be able to then get consulting gigs to help train these people on how to do things better. So really start thinking about, instead of being in this space anymore, going down to a more narrow audience and being really niche. But if you're heavily technical, people love technical stuff on One of the, when I was using Blogger still, one of the posts I put up that had the most hits month after month was something where I just put in the title uh, uh, Pro Tools error message and it was the, the, the message that I got every time I launched my system that I had to like, re like manually fix every time I wanted to record music. And everybody was getting that message and searching for it and finding my blog post. I feel like you could do a pretty good SEO blog just, ca just categorizing error messages and make pretty good money. Now, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions, because we have like, questions from the audience. And if you still have questions, let us know. We'll try to get through as many as we can. Uh, this is a good one, because I think a lot of people run into this, especially if you have a parallel career or a sideline career. If you have two very different brands from two opposite uh, careers, one very high-end, sophisticated business, and the other very light and creative, how would you uh, advertise and market them you know, through social media? Uh, as two separate entities, or maybe merge them. What, what's how, how do you? Because we know I have a lot of people. Okay, I'm an actor, but I don't want everybody to know I'm an actor if I need to get that job over there. You know, because uh, that I'm, that may not get me that job. If, if you're there. selling two different products, and it's, these are right. Yeah. In one end, it's a very high-end, sophisticated tool, and the other end is a very you know more common tool. Separate them, unless there's a rationale for your merger to do. You, for example, my company. We have a very expensive enterprise service, and we're launching a small business service. So obviously, it makes sense for my company to keep the name on both, right? Because one doesn't affect the other, but they both do the same thing, just different audiences. If these are two separate products, where one is high-end and I'm making stuff up here, one's a high-end beauty product, and the other one's a lifestyle brand around a, a beverage, separate them. There's no common ground. You really don't need to do, do create two separate reputations. The reason is, is that on the internet, people go to what they're driven to do. And if you have a very high-end brand, your target audience is absolutely completely different than this other audience. Now, however, if they're both high-end makeup and low-end makeup, you might want to combine the two or at least repurpose content for both pieces. But I would, if, unless they're really tied together, separate them out and manage two properties. Yeah, if you're doing crafts by Janet, I wouldn't also do like legal docs by Janet because I don't think people are going to want, you know, maybe trust the same source for those disparate uh, needs, you know. Yeah, it's a decision. It's a marketing decision for yourself. And people want to have the trust factor because remember that we're dealing with trust. I mean, only 14% of the people now in America trust ads. You know, everybody, everything else is based on each other. And I call it conversation is currency. I mean, what your conversation you have with your friends turns into a job, turns into a job referral, and so on. So make it, uh, you're building the trust factor, and so you want to make sure if it's something is, is uh, different and diverse, then separate them out. Great, great. Um, another qu question is, working in social media, should you specialize in one area, uh, i.e. content, visual design, SEO, or try and learn it all and offer a comprehensive package? What do you do, Bonnie? Because you, you, yeah, yeah, because yeah, that's an interesting it's, one for you. It's an interesting question. If you feel more comfortable with something like maybe one or two of these things in particular, I would say 
focus on those things and make those your strengths. People might ask you for other things and you can say, I can't do that or I can refer you to someone who can, but I wouldn't try to be a jack of all trades if you didn't have it in you and I wouldn't offer it certainly if you couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, so don't try to be everything to everyone. I mean, that goes for almost anything in life. You know, you, it's, very, it's impossible to be an expert in every single thing unless it's something you dedicate to yourself daily. And as, if this is a sideline career, I wouldn't really recommend investing in and in becoming an expert in every single level of this um, field. Also, if you can re consistently be referring work to a friend, I mean, that's, that's work that you're bringing someone else and that's their specialty. They're going to keep you in mind when they have needs that they don't serve. Right. Okay, and that forward. goes back <laughs> yeah. to the idea um, that you said about using each other as a network. I think it's a great idea to, if you specialize in these three things and your friend over here specializes in these three things, you're cross-referring each other and you're building each other's business and brand. Just set up a referral fee. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> if I'm referring idea. you business and you're charging them 125 an hour, which by the way, you guys should be charging 125 an hour. Um, yeah, by the way, you should. Um, you should be setting up referral fees because then you get passive revenue and when you have passive revenue going in the social media space, then you can really start referring and you start, it starts becoming valuable to everybody. I will say one thing, you don't need to be an expert in everything, but you absolutely have to know everything, <laughs> if that makes sense. You don't want to, perhaps you're not selling your SEO services, but if you're creating content, part of your job is going to be perhaps generating visibility of that content. And if you don't have a basic understanding of SEO, which is what the basis of visibility is, then you can't do it. So you still need a knowledge of these things, especially as Terry said, is that the social media industry, it just evolves all the time. But really what you should be also become an expert in is your, your target customer's behavior, especially as the mobile phone grows. Because mobile phones are boyfriends and girlfriends. They're lovers. You sleep with your mobile phone. You wake up with your mobile phone. We haven't talked too much about mobile, but you really want to see, start understanding what's happening in this world. And the consumer, be the, the heart, the most, Successful social media people are people who understand what their customers do, what their customers read, what they write, what they love, what they eat for dinner, what they, what, where they live. So that's what you really need to be an expert in. Great. That's so helpful. Um, how do you pay uh, $7 on Facebook to promote a class oh, great. brand? Yeah, it's, this is brand new. I mean, literally, I did my first one last week just to see what would happen. Is put a post up on your, on your personal Facebook page and then go in and right underneath it, you're gonna see a word that says sponsor. If you click on that button, it'll say for $5, you can get this visibility for three days, or for $7, you can get it, but it's actually a button right under your post that says the word sponsor. It says promote. It says promote on oh, the business page. Oh, on, I'm sorry, personal page, it says sponsor. It may say promote or sponsor, but once you click that button, it changes to the word sponsored, and then people will know it's sponsored, but it's, uh, it's really easy. It's just a button right under the post. Yeah, what it'll do is it tells you what your old visibility opportunity was. So for my post, it said that I had 3% visibility to my target audience before I paid with that post. And after that post, I had 90% visibility. But it doesn't, doesn't tell you the click-throughs. It just tells you the visibility. So you, that's why I had to do a link so I could track the inbound traffic. But you're exactly right. You see, it's still not perfect. But I did increase, so they said, by 90%. To give you an idea, I have a friend who did on their Facebook page, did $10 ads for Razoo's Cajun. You're Texan, you know. And uh, they started getting 100 people a day, 100 new fans a day. And they only did $10 a day, and they only targeted Fort Worth, Texas companies. And they got 100 new fans a day. And that just happened within the last week, to give you a real-time stat. Wow. Try not um, to talk so much. I want to mention, uh, I'm going to ask this question, but I also want to mention about Facebook. Uh, on your personal Facebook, I would suggest that you have it locked and only to your friends that you do it to, because if people are looking now, for, you know, if, when you send your resume off to someone, they Google you right away. And if they go on your Facebook, and I don't know about you, I don't really use Facebook, a lot. I mean, I'm on there, but I don't use it a lot. But I have cousins on there I don't want you to know about, you know, um, <laughs> because of what they write, you know. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, that's what they're going to read. And it's sort of like you are who you hang out with, you know, kind of thing. So be aware of that because that's happening a lot. You're hearing things in 
uh, recently that, that sometimes they're asking for your uh, your your code so that they can they um, can go in when you go for an interview. Well, the, if I speak to those points, sure. I I tend to disagree with that. Okay. Okay. This is this is your okay. strategy. Okay. Because as uh, on Facebook, it's a decision that you need to make for yourself. If you're uh, if you want to keep it as a a part of your business a social presence, then be aware of what goes on there. Um, it's very effective for people who want to know the personal you. It's more effective to have your profile than it is to have a page. Um, but do make a decision. This is a business and a, uh, a decision and a, and a career decision for yourself. Because um, I only I keep my Facebook for friends and family. I keep Twitter and LinkedIn for my professional purposes. So it depends on what you're doing. It really is subjective. And LinkedIn is like a brand safeguard. Mm -hmm. Get it on, even if you don't use it or are not going to put yourself out there looking for jobs through LinkedIn, get on, put your best foot forward with that and all your professional experience, and then that usually trumps a Facebook profile because it's a more authoritative resource on who a, pers you know, who a person is professionally, which is usually what you want to present on the web. However, um, as someone who deals with companies, uh, I will say that I have had CEOs tell me that they will base their hiring decision on someone's Facebook page. So, yeah, go ahead. So actually, this is a really great discussion. One of the reasons is, is Facebook is a recommendation engine. Facebook replaced cocktail parties where we told each other, hey, did you see this movie? You should go see it. Facebook is a recommendation engine. So when you're creating your profile and looking for a job, what you want to do is you want to make stuff visible. So you, there are things you want to make private on your Facebook page, friends only. Like right? if you're traveling. You don't want people to know that you're out of town and anybody in the world can see that you're not at your home. You know. But if you're going to post something, because it is your friends and it is your recommendation, you are building your business. If you're going to post something on your personal page that's business oriented and helps build your reputation, solidifies who you are, I change the visibility to global or to all. So I'll mix the visibility up every time I post. And in Facebook, when you're posting, there's a little globe. And if you click that globe, it tells you how visible you can make things. So I totally agree with both of you. And then last thing, can I quickly say about LinkedIn? There's actually a trick with LinkedIn. Rob told me this trick a long time ago. So if you want a job in social media, if you want a job anywhere, go find social media, go find LinkedIn profiles of people who have those jobs. And look at how they wrote their profile. And look at what keywords and buzzwords they're using. Because today, hiring agents or, or HR managers are going into LinkedIn and they're searching by keyword. So you want to have those keywords in your profile. So go, f go look for people who have the jobs you want and revise your profile using those key terms and make it look. If you can change your profile for the job you want, not the job you have, you have a much better opportunity of getting the job you want. So you really want to revise it. You don't want to falsify it, but you want to position yourself as moving upward or changing your role by being honest, but positioning it differently. And going in and finding people who have jobs at the jobs you want, and looking how they position will really help you revise your profile and make it stronger. Like do a search for Nike social marketing, uh, manager of social marketing, or um, some brand that you, really man that you really respect and aspire, even if you wanted to work at that place. Go look how their guy's doing it, and then, mm -hmm. and then use the verbiage to actually accentuate what you've done. Don't just fabricate stuff. And then uh, one other trick that I've done on uh, Facebook is if I want to share some racy content but I don't necessarily want my nieces and nephews to see it, I have a, a list of friends that's just called See No Evil. And then I say, don't show this content to just that list. And then all my nieces and nephews don't get that think, adult material. Well, yes, I think there's a, whole other <laughs> there's a whole other presentation that could be done on how to use Facebook and maximize it because there are over 33 privacy settings and custom settings on Facebook that people don't realize. And like the lists and how to use all that and groups and secret groups. Did you know you could have a secret conversation in Facebook? I use that with my students. So you, you just, uh, so there are a lot of different things, but uh, just thinking about how, I you know, in LinkedIn again, how the great thing about it is it's editable. You can change things. So don't feel like it's a, a paper resume that you're stuck with. You know, you can evolve, you can make these change, they're very fluid. And I, I want to say, is it the numbers that I hear are headhunters or people looking for people to place in jobs, uh, go to LinkedIn for about 85 to 95 percent of those placements. Yeah. So that's another reason why it's so extremely critical to have, uh, start building, even before you do your Twitter first account or your Instagram first account. Get yourself on LinkedIn as a professional first. 
and then just really build that out, I think. Go into LinkedIn, LinkedIn time Answers. Time. LinkedIn Answers. Just go in and answer those questions. I'm telling you, it ties to your profile. I'm a PR expert. I don't do PR. Never did PR. I couldn't figure out why people were hiring me for PR jobs. And then I realized it's because I'm listed as an expert in the PR field on LinkedIn. But I didn't, anyway. The other thing, too, is that whenever you correct, you know, you add something, you change it, or you enhance it on LinkedIn, what happens is, Every week, you'll hear from you know there'll there'll be an update of of things, and you'll be on people's update list. And uh, we found out about a guy that who now we're very connected with, who's working with LACC and is helping us with our computer program. That happened out of because we learned that he changed jobs. You know, so when you know it's a good way to stay updated with people around you. Um, can I ask you one thing too? Can you have two different Facebook? Like, if you had a, you might maybe you have your personal Facebook account, and you could have a business pay, Facebook account, right? I mean, you should you do yeah, that. Of course. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And you can actually handle them both from the same login. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I wouldn't set up like have two emails and said, "I'm Rob Getchman professionally," and then here's my Rob Getchman musician. You set up a page for yourself. Uh, you set up your account, right. and then you set up a page for whatever your music brand is. You know? Well, in order to have a business page, you have to have a personal profile attached to it. So here, the question that I get asked a lot is, well, I, I started one for my business already, but now I, I want to start another one. What do I do? I, well, right now I have a personal profile on Facebook, but I want to start one for a business and make it more professional, not have everybody see my family's pictures. Mm -hmm. So what I recommend they do, because you're not supposed to have two personal profiles on Facebook. So I say, you know, use your middle name or make it a professional name if it's associated with your business. So it's, uh, so it's not as informal, make it more formal. And that's a workaround, you know, that's what I do. Anybody else have any ideas with you that? You can attach more than one business to a personal yeah. profile. Yeah, I manage about 10 different pages, whether it's creative or, or, or corporate, you know. My fake account's yeah, name is Sassafras McGee. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in the situation, though, if it's yet. A, <laughs> let, me, let me ask you this: in a situation where a person already has a personal profile where they have their family stuff on it, mm -hmm. and then they want to start a new one that's going to be attached to their business, a new personal, a profile? nurse new personal profile. Well, you can do a new personal profile and not generate any information on it, even have it just be a blank pro personal profile and connect it to business accounts, right. and no one will ever see that profile. And you can do that with the, by the same like that. how changing your name a little bit so you can accommodate yeah. that. Yeah. Or use a false name. Yeah, you just have to have a different email address, which is why I have like 900 email addresses. If you're addresses. the CEO, you don't want to use a false name. You want to use your real name. But how well, do you but, use that? Yeah, too? so what you do oh, is okay. you would say, so if John Smith has his own personal page and John Smith is a partier, but John Smith wants his business page, yeah, you would do John C. Smith or John Smith CEO or John Smith. Mo Greed, or you could just change the name and swap it over. It's uh, just changing the admin status. It's not that hard. Great. Uh, this is a this is one from Sheila uh, for Bonnie. Uh, what is a typical hourly rate for doing social media for a small or larger company? Do you ever charge clients uh, for the month instead of hourly? That's a really good question. Well, I try. <laughs> My, the rate that I'll, I'll do an introductory rate with clients and that'll be anywhere from 50 up. And then if they aren't comfortable with it, it depends on my workload. And if, it, if I'm working a lot, you know, then I, I just don't take on new clients. But when I first started, I started around 30 an hour. I mean, I really needed to hustle and that's what I started with. And I have clients that are up to 100 an hour, but those are the clients you cultivate and keep and do more for, mm -hmm. but you have to, or at least in my experience, I had to be willing to start low, lower than I wanted. But you'll you'll get clients that will pay you more. That's right. Can I jump in on this? So yeah. this, I actually went through this when I started. When I quit Business Wire, walked out of a newswire industry, no job in SEO, no job in social media. I had a three-month marketing job, and then I had to get my own job, and I started consulting. And I just started charging 125 an hour, and nobody blinked. Nobody blinked. People started to blink when PR professionals started offering social media for free. Then you started getting the pushback. There's a big industry, there's a big belief that social media is free. Well, I don't know about you guys, but or I don't that work. it can be done by teens. Like, or, oh, yeah, take on an intern can do it. and Any, I, let them I, be the voice your I Facebook every day. You can do this for free. Absolutely not. Facebook takes an average. You're talking 20 to 40 hours a week if you're wondering, if you're going to create a strong program and work it. That's a lot of your time. So build normally. However, I also stagger billing. I used to do that where I'd split strategy but would be one fee, 125, and execution would be 35 to 50. And then I would take it at a 40 hour week or 50 hour or 20 hour week, depending on the size of the program, I would average, average out my hours and I would bill a monthly fee right. based and on that. For different like 
different talents that you're offering do different rates for that? I mean, for photography, no, not 30, mm -hmm. not 50, you know, 150 an hour, or a project rate. Mm -hmm. You can do a project rate for a photo shoot or something like that. Um, definitely, if you're using different talents and different skills, use a different rate, and especially if it's something that requires more um, of a specific skill set. Setting up a website is another thing that you should be charging a lot more for. You know. Content creation, video creation, all of these pieces of creation, just like photography, it isn't you just snapping a photo, right? You've got to edit the photo, you've got to do all this work, so you really build this in and build it at a higher rate. Remember, you're setting your standard. If they think you're cheap, then it's rare that you're going to get somebody who's willing to say, hey, listen, why don't we start at this rate and talk about it later, unless you discuss in advance and go up higher. If you start cheap, you'll always end up in that price range. So separate yourself out by saying, I can really do this job, and I'm going to really rock it out, but you've got to pay me for it. But also, you've got to be able to show an example, and that's why you want to at least volunteer and do one for free so you have that case study under your belt. And also, I think there, like, that point about um, misconceptions, because the platforms or the channels are free, there's, the sweat equity is still there. So that's what you're billing for. And uh, to keep that in mind, sometimes you, want do a, you might want to do a flat rate. But what I find helps in developing business is to start with a test. Use the word test because it makes people feel a little bit more comfortable because people are still afraid. I mentioned that at the beginning of this. There's still this fear about social media. Well, what if it doesn't work? What if it screws up? You know? And what if I waste my money? I don't want to waste my money. Well, then if you say, well, let's do a test and find out maybe there's an event that they want to promote or there's a, a special product that they're introducing and say, let's work together and we'll, we'll, we'll walk through this path together. And it's also an app opportunity for you to learn as well and for them to learn because what I find is that we're constantly educating people like we are today about what it is what are the benefits so you're not alone in this because literally you everybody around the country around the world they're asking the same questions so you learn together that's the great thing about it I think okay, okay we have one more question uh, do you have any advice on how to grow from one platform like if you start on Twitter to another platform you know, that's, it's kind of, you talked a little bit about at least yeah. start on Twitter before. Just jump in. Just I jump mean, in. You, once, if you're on Twitter and you're jamming on Twitter and you're like, you know what, I've got to create a Facebook page. The reality is the minute you create any new site, you're starting at zero. Mm -hmm. So the best thing you can do is a couple of things. One, cross promote. If you've got a great Twitter feed. You think of it as syndication, you know, yeah. like you can actually tie your Twitter to your Facebook. I feel like you get less engagement on those. Actually, don't do that. I don't like Facebook doing that, no. just came, Another thing that Facebook came out is don't use Buffer app or HootSuite or TweetDeck or any automated service to post into Facebook. You need to manually go in and do it yourself. Facebook reduces your visibility by something like 60% if you use a third-party service. Well, and that's, yeah, and so if you write a Which tweet... It's not that hard to cut and paste it into Facebook, yeah. whereas if you use the app to tether it, um, it loses visibility. But you're still syndicating your content. You can put that same stuff on Tumblr, too. And create a strategy around it, right? So if you're going to take a tweet, if you're going to start on Twitter, which is textual, and you're going to move to Facebook, you might want to start adding photo photography. Oh, you might want to start... Everything with a photo gets more visibility. We, ha Add, we had a conversation a photo about photos. We did... Beats by Dre was a client, and we did Tupac uh, Shakur with their anniversary of his death, and we did a photograph of him. He did the tribute photo, and it's perfect for that demographic. Thousand shares, thousand likes. The next day, we did a photograph of a puppy dog eating a pair of Beats headphones. 6,000 shares, 6,000 <laughs> likes. Your industry icon, a dog eating your product. The dog won. The internet is for cats and dogs, really. It truly is. And the, the number one, the pieces of content that people like most, whether it's on the computer, mobile, mobile now is not just your phone, it's iP iPads and everything else. It's video and photos. And the biggest photo day of the year is Halloween, not Christmas or <laughs> So that's coming up. But if, and think about Twitter, it's not just, although it says 140 characters, it's, not, it's really more of a window to the world because you can put links for anything, pictures, video, documents, anything else you want to link into Twitter. But the really key here is to link everything. Yeah, as everybody's saying here, we agree. Correct. Yeah. Correct. However, I do. There used to be used to be able to use Twitter into LinkedIn, and yeah. so you, you, you can it. still do they some do away, yeah. linking, like some repurposing of the exact same content into places through syndication. But that the fastest way to grow a second platform is to share your content, promote it to your original content, 
do not forget that every time you send out an email, your email signature should have your LinkedIn profile, it should have all your profiles in it. You've got to promote your, your new platform everywhere you possibly can. Mm -hmm. So did I tell you guys that I'm at Serena on Twitter? <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? Like everywhere you go when you're launching a new platform, you want to make sure that you're, you're promoting it on your existing client. You're sending out an email to your friends. If you're launching a Facebook page, go to your personal page and be like, hey peeps, I really need some help. Can you guys please like my fan page? Can you tell your friends about it? Can you help me out? People love to help, ask for it. And you can easily, if you're doing a tweet and you want more retweets, ask for it. Put an RT question mark at the end. That means retweet please. People will retweet it for you. If it's on your Facebook page and you want someone to share an, uh, something for you, ask for it. However, on Facebook, people are really stupid. So you actually have to write it out please click the share button right here and move over. People do not, I mean, you have no idea. No, it's not like NASA scientists, like everybody turns into four-year-olds when they're on Facebook. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. So spell it out. But if you ask for help on, through your friend network, people will give it to you. So anytime you launch a new platform, just promote it out on your old platforms, but just make sure that whatever you're putting in this new platform is slightly different than what you've got everywhere else. So if you're putting the same tweet on Twitter and Facebook, add the photograph to Facebook. Okay. I mean, you could do the photo, to, of course, to both, but you want to make sure that you're just mixing it up a little bit, because otherwise, why would someone follow you on three different channels if they're just getting the same thing? But this is important to the voice, excuse me, uh, so we're talking about linking different platforms together if you're managing, let's say, three. You've got Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. The conversation or the language needs to be a little bit different for each one of those, although it's you, uh, in Twitter, you can have the short speak, the letter R for R and so on. Don't use that language in Facebook or LinkedIn. It gets people very angry. Facebook can be more of a conversation, a little bit longer of a statement, and LinkedIn is always professional. So it's, your, it's you, but it's, it's you whether you, I, I compare it to this. The LinkedIn conversation is dinner at a fine restaurant with wine and candles. You know, Facebook is at uh, like uh, uh, Chili's, okay, and and uh, and Twitter is at fast food, you know, McDonald's. So it's just the There's difference, sort of. Go right ahead and give me credit for it, okay? okay. <laughs> so, but it's uh, it's that your your language is different, okay? okay. I'd well, like to add really quickly. Yeah, go ahead. Don't be afraid to interact with people on Twitter. You're sure. going to have a bunch of people that follow you and that you follow. Um, and it looks intimidating at first because you see all these different names and you think, oh, that person would never interact with me. But don't be afraid to reach out, mm -hmm. direct message if you don't want to do it over the whole thing, mm -hmm. um, or include them, you know, at their name in your tweet, and they'll see it. It'll probably yeah. come up in their feed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I search for certain words and for our company words and that kind of thing. So, yeah, get, get the word out there and use all the resources you can within these platforms. I mean, it used to be with tweets, just, you know, it used to be that, you you know, you were going and you were, t you know, the, the tweet people were connecting with the organization. Now if you watch the news or you watch the debates, you know, you, you hear them saying, what, what's happening with the tweets? I mean, somebody actually has a job that they have to announce all the tweets that came in right after the person spoke. So it's a whole different world. We've run out of time. I need to tell you a couple of things. You can talk afterwards, ask any question. Okay, but we, we are out of time. I have to stop at a certain time. Um, I want to just mention a couple of things, one of which there are sheets with resources and there are sheets with uh, information if you want to do small business uh, over uh, on that table. Secondly, there are uh, 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 something you have to write out uh, t so that you can let us know that you, whether you like this or you don't like this. And uh, the other thing I want to mention, uh, how, those of you that are not part of the Actors Fund work program and you want to be and you want to get more of this type of thing, we do have a social media class and we, uh, that we do once a month and we have all different kinds of things that we do. Uh, all you have to do is come to a, an orientation on Monday at 1 o'clock on the fourth floor, suite 400 to this building, and you're in. So please, please do that. And with that, I would like for you to give a, a very good applause to a wonderful panel. Thank you very much.